Hello and welcome to the Promised Land, a show about Manchester United and part of the 90 Min Podcast Network. I'm Scott Saunders, joined by Rob Blanchett as ever to talk all things Manchester United. They play Everton on Friday and we will not be talking about that because by the time you're probably listening to this, the game will be over. So uh, just getting that out of the way. Rob, how are you doing? Not too bad. Yes, embargoed FA Cup chat because by the time you're <laughs> listening to this, United might already be out of the FA Cup if I'm being a doomist, or they might have got Frank Lampard the sack. Maybe he's been sacked already. Who knows? You know, it's one of these things. But uh, yeah, I'm doing well. Looking forward, actually, to the Cup game. He says that before these things happen. Um, but United are in a good place at the moment. It's a so are we. Chelsea beaten by Manchester City on Indeed. Thursday night. United now 10 points ahead of Chelsea, who are in 10th. That's a hell of a lot of ground to make up, especially when Chelsea are playing as badly as they are. Uh, United look playing okay. Two different, two difficult games coming up in the league against City at home and Liverpool and Arsenal away. Uh, good tests ahead. But United are looking all right. So we're going to talk today a little bit about existing squad members, uh, situations about why we are not or why we won't be seeing them in the near future. I'm talking uh, Donny van der Beek there. Obviously, there is an injury that it looks pretty serious. We we await further news on that. We'll talk Jaden Sancho as well. And we'll talk some, maybe along the lines, Rob, of what should United do? What profile of striker should United try and sign? Because uh, there's a number of transfer targets that have been uh, mentioned alongside United over the last few days. Uh, one thing from us at 90 Min, Mohamed Kudus, there is interest there. Whether that actually happens in January is anybody's guess. Probably more likely that more unlikely than likely at the moment. Uh, let's say that, but things can change pretty fast. Or do United go for a short-term option? Olivier Giroud has been mentioned, and I love him. I'm just putting that out there. Let us know <laughs> if you do or you don't in the comments. Uh, you can subscribe to our show wherever you get your pods, Apple, Google, Spotify, and the likes. And watch us usually on Tuesdays and Fridays, twice a week. Although the days might change here and there depending on when United are playing. So head over to YouTube as well. Hit like, subscribe, comment, and join the community. Let us know if you like Olivier Giroud or if you think Mohamed Kudus is the answer or Memphis Depay or Vincent Abubakar or anyone uh, that you've seen linked with United over the last few days. Follow us on Twitter too, at underscore Scott Saunders, at underscore Rob underscore B, and at Promise and MU for the show. Let's start, Rob with we'll go wherever we want with this because this is pretty loose right what profile of striker should Manchester United sign in January because Eric Ten Hag has made no secret of the fact that he wants a new player and United's cash position is not great they have already missed out on Cody Gakpo who's joined Liverpool and they didn't move for him for whatever reason, whether you believe in the United side of things or whether you believe Liverpool are that much better in the transfer market than United are. He now plays for Liverpool. Maybe not the right profile of player. Do they need a? Do they need Olivier Giroud? Do they need a Mohamed Kudus who can play in four positions? Rob, take it away. God, we could do this segment, I think, for about half an hour without taking a breath. <laughs> uh, what do we know about this situation and where are, where are we? Now, what would we know from Man United fans' point of view is that United fans want a striker. They want a number nine. They look at Haaland or the likes or kind of that kind of player in world football and they go, that's what we want. Get us a number nine. That's not what managers are kind of saying at the moment and that's not what we're hearing from Manchester United in terms of the profile of player that Eric Ten Hag is looking at. He is still looking at wide players that can play in that channel in that 4-2-3-1 and can either come central or start central and go wide. So this is why with all these names being linked to United in terms of the forward line, they're all kind of a little bit off the profile. I think the United fans would really, truly like. So the Giroud one becomes, I think, almost the most interesting link because he's a guy that's done it in the Premier League. You show at the World Cup, there's still plenty of life in his legs. But he is 36, he is short term, and you'd probably have to offer him a pretty big contract to leave Italy because I think he's quite happy out there. I think he's, you know, lived his life out there, he's enjoying it. But would he like one last shot at the Premier League at a really big club? So 
it's all these things to factor in about where Man United are going to go. I think the Gakpo thing, again, is a barometer on where United are. United would have liked Gakpo, but they stalled. They don't really have the liquid cash. They couldn't put the deal together that PSV wanted. So what's to say they could put any deal together where other clubs would want for any other player? So where, where do you stand? So you're at a bit of a stalemate, but I still do think that United's ambition is to bring in a forward. That seems to be where they, they are going to land. And I think we will see someone in January, even though like our gut instinct, we both said this individually, haven't we? That it kind of feels that United are just going to sit on their hands and do no business. And the, 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 the big bong will go at the end of January transfer window and we'll go, oh, Man United didn't sign anyone except maybe yeah. Jack Butland. You could take the maybe out of that. I think I think that's done. <laughs> we know uh, that. if yeah. that that is not confirmed as we record this, but we are expecting it to be confirmed. Maybe even by the time you're listening to this, so don't yeah. hold that against us. Plenty of different. We talked about uh, striker options in the summer. We've done it on previous shows, Rob. Mm-hmm. United are in this position here where they have to make a decision on whether they go for the short term option, whether they try and get a profile of player that Ten Hag loves on not on the cheap but maybe mid length mid term uh, in terms of cost i personally think along the same lines as you that i think they'll go for the cheap short term option and then review the situation in the summer but uh never say never i mean stranger things have happened uh and united have been buying players on a credit card as it's been put all year so uh, let's. Who do we want to talk about first? I meant, you know, you mentioned Giroud there. Uh, let me throw some names at you: Olivier Giroud, uh, Chupo Moting, Memphis Depay, Mohamed Kudus, uh, Abu Bakar. There are a ton of them, an absolute ton of them. And then there's your likes of Victor Osim and Harry Kane, uh, Gonzalo Ramos in the summer, who may be potentially on the agenda there, but. Who's who's deciding this? Eric Ten Hag is pushing, I'm sure, for his very best option. I'm sure he would love a player that he knows that he's worked with before, that he knows is the right profile of age and this kind of thing, can play in a number of positions. I'm sure he'd be pushing for that now. And the people who are saying no, perhaps at the club, right? Yeah, I think, you know, in terms of interest and where you could go immediately, and if you were looking at, let's say you were looking at something a bit more permanent, but with less risk, or maybe less issues in terms of how you're going to put a deal together. I think Turam is still the most interesting in that ballpark, but there's going to be a lot of takers for him. You know, it's just how it is. I think Kudos, as you said, is a player that that Ten Hag signed in 2020 for 8 million euros for Ajax. And he's done really well there. He's grown, you know, substantially. Look at his numbers. He's a really, really good player. He's a player that can play wide but is definitely morphing into a central entity. Really good number 10, really good number nine, scores goals, really creative. Kind of the player exactly that Ten Hag wants. However, you've only got to put the name Manchester United is linked with Kudos in there. And this £8 million player, who's probably worth £20 million, is now worth £40 million. So this is where Ajax are going. Ajax are saying... If Ajax also player, know from first-hand experience that United will pay them whatever they want. <laughs> Ajax have got the Anthony premium staple to every player that they've got, and even Martinez to an extent, yeah? So, so this is the thing. Uh, someone randomly tweeted me, just a, a Man United fan, said, you know, if Ten Hag keeps going back to Ajax for this, like, for this kind of treadmill of footballers, what does it say about our director of football? What does it say about John Murto? Because it's not like the directorship are identifying targets it seems like the manager is. It seems like the manager's going, well, I worked with this guy, so let's go and get him. And United go, do they want to cost some money? Let's throw some money at that. Now the, the well has run dry, so to speak, in terms of cash. So I think I think Kudus is the perfect fit for what he's trying to do. And I think Turam is pretty much there as well. But like I keep saying, someone like Giroud, yeah, that's fine. But what are you going to do, Scott? You're going to give him a year or two. You've already done the Cavani experiment not saying they're the same type of players, but it's an older player who brings experience, brings other things rather than just scoring goals. And does he really fit a team that wants to play high energy and pressing? I don't know. Would he be a bench piece? You know, would you want like go Martial first, Giroud second? I think that's probably more likely with this manager. 
But I'm not saying that Giroud's a bad player. I just doubt his kind of suitability to what United are trying to do right in this moment of time. But he's exactly the kind of short-term option that the Glazers have looked at over many, many years. You know, pay this guy tons of money. You know, he sat on the bench a lot at Arsenal and Chelsea, didn't he, Scott? Mm -hmm. And that's when he was a bit younger. So he did really well at the World Cup. Still a really good number nine. But do you really need a number nine? And does Ten Hag really shop him for a number nine? I think that's the real kind of crux of this debate. Another potential talking point you mentioned there, Rob, about what United want that along those lines. Do United know what United are doing? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> no, we know we've known this for a long time. Like, I think this is why Ten Hag is doing a pretty spectacular job because he's taken all the broken bits, isn't he? And I wouldn't say he's completely fixed them, but he's he's repurposed everything, isn't he? He's kind of taken things and gone, you're an Aaron Wambasaka. You're doing nothing for the club. So I'm going to try and get you to do something for the club or I'll sell you one or the other. We'll get we'll get there in the end. You know, you either go because we can get FIFA or you stay because I've made you into a better player and you can take the credit for that. Because I think Ten Hag, again, is good at doing that, isn't he? He lets the players take the credit. He's not really an ego, is he? He's not, you know, he, he, he organises. That's the kind of coach he is. So that's where United are. And I think when you look at the forward line and you look at maybe the lack of goals... Is it because of creativity? Is it because of numbers? Is it because you haven't got a striker? We can debate that until we're blue in the face. This manager wants a player that can play in the half space and come into the centre. That's Anthony Martial, but you need someone else. And I think that's kind of where he's going. That's the direction of the club. So you're saying, do the club know? No, I don't think they do. And I think that there's so much turmoil in the boardroom now. You know, certainly trying to get this deal done in Q1 financially to have new owners. Lots of talk behind the scenes about, you know, is it going to be Dubai? You know, who's is it going to be a British backer, an American backer? That's still very much up in the air. And I think while that is up in the air, you can see that United are much more happy as sitting on their hands. Yeah, I think there's uh, what Eric Ten Hag wants and then there is uh, the club who are, like you say, in turmoil or in process of turnover in limbo, whichever word you want to use. <clears throat> limbo is better than turmoil. I think limbo is the good fit. Tur turmoil is uh, limbo, but negative, yeah. right? Limbo yeah. is more just limbo. I, yeah, I, I, think, <laughs> well, I think we've been in turmoil. Like, I think the club has been in turmoil so many times since Fergie. You know, we get, I was thinking about Eric Ten Hag only yesterday. I was thinking, I can remember all these good times with Mourinho and Van Gaal and kind of going, yeah, we're getting it. Even Ole, those first 20 games, you get this kind of feel-good factor. And that's kind of where we are now with Ten Hag. And I'm thinking, oh, I hope we don't get to the end of the season and we come fifth. And then we're literally having these all old conversations of turmoil saying that. I think the club is in limbo simply in the sense of that because they don't know who's signing the checks long term, it's kind of like they've just put the checks away in the, in the back drawer and gone, well, we've got, we can do business. But we're not quite sure. We haven't really got a shirt sponsor yet. Like, do you get? Do you know what I mean? They've had to buy that contract back. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are really important commercially. That's how football works. But at the same time, it's about it's about trying to have targets, but have realistic ones as well. About what can you go and shop for at this very moment of time? It would not surprise me if United try and just go forward with what they've got because the squad is still pretty full, whether you like some of those players or not. For me, that is still the most likely thing that will happen this month. Of course. But uh, that's not to that's say that... That's the frugal option, isn't it? That's the frugal option. Of course. That, that's United's approach. That's so probably going to be the Glazers' approach, given United are playing well. They're in the top four. That's the the revenue stream coming in if they get top four Champions League. Mm -hmm. There are other teams who are underperforming who, to be honest, don't look like they're going to turn around and win 12 games in a row at mm -hmm. the moment talking about a number of other teams there who are outside of the top four. So United are in good position. And if United can get through the top four without having to expense any fur anything further until the sale is completed or the, the future investment is completed, then they can reassess in the summer. I don't, what I don't want to see is I don't want to see a Man United pick up a cheap option and then that makes them not go full ham and like fix the problem in the summer. I don't want to see that. Uh, so well, we will see how uh, how this pans out. And the reason why you're seeing all these names, you might say some of them are fake or whatever, but, you know, these are there's plenty of people in the club who have their say. There's plenty of people in the club who think 
this is the best option. United are going to mm. come up with a short list of targets anyway. And didn't Man United have like 800 right backs or something like that when they tried to, when they signed Aaron Wan-Bissaka and he was the best one. So you see yeah. all these names that are coming out in links with Man United and you could say some of uh, like rubbish or whatever. Some of them might be, but most of them probably have some element of substance to them. Yeah, look, we try and do our due diligence in terms of like when we talk about things, like we, I, we can talk about gossip to as I always say to we're blue in the face. But you, you, you like to know that there is there's truth somewhere behind it or, you know, the right people are saying the right things. I think that's what we try and do on this show. But ultimately, it's, it's about what are Man United looking for and what Man United saying they're looking for. And they are looking for this wide forward that can play central. So that's not coming for us. We're not making that up. That's not that's not Scott and Rob's opinion. This is kind of where it's coming from. But like you said, you can still question the validity of that and saying, do United know what they're doing? Because a lot of United fans would say, well, why are you buying another wide forward? Well, we can talk a little bit about that today, about Jaden Sancho and, and similar situations about why Ten Hag might be willing to rest in those areas. But it's what what cash have they got? Who are they going for? And whether really this ownership now wants to spend when it's on its way out? Because I think that's more that's more what this is about. I don't think that the project itself at United is stalling or thinking that, you know, they don't know what to do completely. But it doesn't give you good faith, does it, when you look at them? It doesn't feel like John Murto is driving stuff in a sporting direction. And Richard Arnold has come in and now gone a bit quiet, hasn't he? You know, his little soapbox moment and all of these things. And now he's in the stand, not really doing a lot. And you kind of think, well, are these people really driving it or are they waiting to see what happens? I think it's more that at the moment. They want to see who the next bidder for the club is going to be. And that's going to dictate a lot of stuff. It really is. Like, I know that sounds obvious, but that's where Man United are at the moment. Uh, just going to take a pause a second, Rob, because uh, awful news for the football world uh, this morning. We've uh, we've learned that former Chelsea player, manager, uh, former Sampdoria player, Juventus player, Gianluca Vialli, a legend of Italian football, a legend of football, you know, known and loved in England as well as uh, has passed away. Uh, really awful, tragic news, mate. Yeah, tragic, a complete legend. Um, you know, I was saying to you before the show that like my favourite club outside of United, outside of England, always was Juventus, going back to when I was a kid for for uh, my own reasons. And of course, Viali was a, a massive figurehead of that, really. The, the Maybe the Eric Cantona of Juventus in many ways, you know, the player that everyone looked towards for their... Uh, for their steer in, in 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 the game. And I think when he came to England, it was a big shock when he came to Chelsea. And it was revolutionary because it's something that things people weren't doing. And he came to England at a time when English football was still pretty much unfashionable. Yeah, he came to Chelsea and he did the job there. Um, so, yeah, incredibly tragic news. Uh, an icon, a great player. We lost another player. Obviously, we lost Pele recently. And now we've lost Viale. Um, you know, just obviously thoughts go out to everyone connected with him. Obviously, a lot of people in our jobs here who, who knew him through the press because of his time in London. Um, just incredibly sad news. This is what I'm seeing. I'm looking at my my stream. My out, There's an outpouring of love. But Gianluca Vialli, uh, it's just such terrible news. Uh, like I say, a legend of football, legend of Italian football, mm. loved by Chelsea. Uh, loved by many who who've worked with him over the past few years as well. Age of fifty eight, unfortunately, uh, we've lost Gianluca Vialli. Um, terrible news. We'll, we'll move on to uh, Man United uh, because that's the, the podcast. I mean, <sighs> there is news that Man United will sign Jack Butland uh, on. I think it, it's a loan deal, mm -hmm. although I think he's out of contract at the end of the season. Uh, so I would imagine that if this goes well, he might end up turning up on a free transfer. Yeah. Uh, I'm seeing United are getting, I, not not criticised for this, but some people are looking at why you're signing Jack Butland. Well, it's pretty obvious why United are signing Jack Butland, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's a it's a fairly decent signing. You know, I think with Jack Butland, you're not signing him to rip up trees. You're signing him for coverage. So 
Ten Hag spoke in his press the other day about last year at Ajax where he had his three main goalkeepers get injuries and he was in a bit of a pickle and that kind of taught him a lesson about goalkeeper coverage. So he didn't want to name Jack Butland, like he was really quite keen on not saying a name, but we knew Jack Butland was booked in for his medical, so we don't know how that went, but we assumed it went okay. Um, and I think, you know, you, you forget that Jack Butland was part of the England party that went to the 2018 World Cup. You know, it, it feels like a long time ago, but he was one of England's top goalkeepers. So he's had a, a, a downtime, obviously, since then, and his stock has fallen dramatically. But I think when you look in experience, you know, 29 years old, England international, um, kind of in and out at Crystal Palace. And, and the deal, I think, is what makes him attractive. As you said, in six months time or less, his contract expires at, at Palace, means he's a free agent. And it means that if you're going to stick with David De Gea, and this is what we're hearing. We do believe this now. We've believed it for a little while, a few weeks, that David De Gea is going to stay on a reduced deal and David De Gea is going to stay as Manchester United's number one, whether you like his sweeper keeper feet or not. So it seems to me that he's improved in those metrics. But at the same time, I think when you've got someone like Butland, you know, he's six foot five, he's a big unit, he's a good goalkeeper. He's perfect to have on your bench and he's better than Dubravka. So he's an upgrade, I think, in those terms. But you know, you're signing this player because you do just need that coverage at goalkeeper. I think Heaton as well, we don't know what's going on with him. I think he might leave the club sooner rather than later. Kind of that little uh, journey might have come to an end. So Butler would be a good player, I think, to keep on as your number two next year and beyond if you are keeping David De Gea. You either go for a really young goalkeeper, don't you? Or go for someone experienced. So Butler has got all that Premier League experience. That's quite rare. You're talking about Tom Heaton there. I don't know... I can see him stay until he's 40. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we'll see. Be the next goalkeeper there's, there's coach. Other, there's, other, <laughs> there's other goalkeepers who've been at like, the likes of Chelsea who've stayed there, signed co new contracts year after year. Mm -hmm. I think Man City have had them for years as well. Talking Scott Carson, uh, you know, that homegrown yeah. player. And of course, Tom Heaton is homegrown at United as well. So that takes a different box mm -hmm. as well. So uh, we'll see. Jack Butland, if you are listening to this, has probably signed. <laughs> Man United. Uh, we are expecting that, but we're recording before it's confirmed, but it's effectively done. And uh, let's talk about other Man United players. Uh, two existing squad members that we'll finish the show off with. We didn't talk about Donny van der Beek the other day, Rob. No. On our last show, but obviously... Has had his chances limited? Everybody knows the, the fallout with van der Beek over the la last few years. The fact that he's barely played, the fact that when he has played, he's not been very good. Um, the fact that now Eric Ten Hag, who is the manager he broke through under at Ajax, is now his manager at Manchester United and he's not really getting any chances. He does get a chance in the game against Bournemouth and picks up what looks to be a serious injury. Uh, now, Ten Hag hasn't confirmed this yet. I don't think United even know the extent of this as we speak. But looking at it, it doesn't look good um, and it could be a bad one. Yeah, it doesn't look good. We we don't really know too much depth on it. It's just that that's the vibes coming out from United is that it just doesn't look particularly great for him. Um, he's just really been a continual wave, tidal wave, isn't it? Or bad luck for Van der Beek, but also bad form. So, you know, again, I said to you off camera, didn't I, that, that even in that game before the injuries, only a short period of time on the pitch, I still don't get that vibe off him that that he's the answer. That this is the Donny van der Beek that was in the Champions League scoring goals in the semi-final and this was the player you were buying. It still feels that that person is absent somewhere. Um, Ten Hag hasn't seemed to be able to change that for whatever reason, you know, in the, in the short period that he's been at the football club. And this injury is just going to set him back even further. So United, I think, will be looking beyond Donny van der Beek now. You know, we talk about transfer markets and players. Uh, it might get to the point where you're looking more towards a midfielder now as the next big signing, as opposed to a forward, because you have got forwards, you know, they are at the club. You know, we didn't mention someone like Ansi Alanga. You know, if you're going to just get a stopgap, do you let Alanga go out on loan? Or do you just keep him as the stopgap on your bench, mm -hmm. filling up minutes, you know, filling up time in cup competitions or late in games? Or are you going to go and give someone a new contract? So Donny van der Beek also fits into that category of, of, of filler, you know, from midfield. He's very much, I think, Bruno Fernandes' filler in many ways. But if he's not and he can't do it and he's injured or he's out the scene, you can probably feel that his chances at Man United are hugely depreciating now. 
yeah, we await to see the severity uh, when it's confirmed of that Donny van der Beek injury. I'd imagine we all know in the next few days. Uh, bad news. He's out. It's been such bad luck for him. I know it's not gone as he would have planned that he's lost his place in the Dutch national team because he's not been playing mm. for United as well. Uh, it's just all around. It seemed like such a good move at the time, but it's another one, isn't it? it, it, it do you know, it's a classic like Eredivisie failure in that players who look good in the Eredivisie, you know, and this is not to get at the Netherlands, you know, we've got a coach now from there and we've bought a load of players from there. It is a tough place to come to the Premier League and replicate what you do in that league. I think the same issue falls for players like Malassia. Do you know what I mean? Malassia, who looked like an incredible progressive at his club in the Eredivisie. He's an international like Van der Beek. But when you see him in games in the Premier League, we see him doing that. His function is compromised because it's difficult to do it in the Premier League. It's not saying he won't work it out, but it's just hard. You see with Donny van der Beek being at the club now, what, longer than two years? You know, two and a half years at the football club? I cannot remember one great game he's had really good games like one or two or three but i can't remember scored on his team. debut didn't he didn't he, he? In, a, his... in a loss against crystal palace at home <laughs> exactly with a few minutes and, and that was like when he scored that goal you thought this is someone a little bit that. Yeah, yeah look a third man runner scoring a goal yay we haven't got one of those and then he never made a third man run ever again so it's kind of like it is difficult with van der Beek, and i do think that just as time clicks along and if injuries now start to pile up, because his health has been an issue as well. Like Again, the manager's spoken about that in depth, about getting him on a football pitch. If he's off for any substantial time now with a significant injury, it's, uh, yeah, it could well, very well be the end of Donny van der Beek at Old Trafford. He's also played on loan at Everton, which I forgot about until just now. And did um, nothing. And so did like nothing. He, he, two, three really good games at Everton and then way too much mediocrity. So that would have been perfect for him to even just... You know, do a Jesse Lingard at West Ham, innit? Let your hair down, go play as a 10, be creative, score goals, make people like you again, make managers want you again. But I think with Donny, you know, his market shrinking all the time, month by month by month. And I think eventually United will go, right, we have to cut our losses. I can even see him being like a free transfer one day soon, Scott. Like, to get him off the bill, if new owners come in and you want to restructure your wage bill, you're going to cut off the bits like Donny van der Beek because they're not actually delivering what you need in matches. Just looking up his contract, five year contract he signed, didn't yeah. You? yeah. So, um, be a little while yet. But another player that uh has been absent, we'll finish the show off with this. Another player who's been absent, obviously, is Jaden Sancho. We haven't talked mm. too much about him because we haven't really known what was going on. Mm. However, Eric Ten Hag has been asked a number of times about why we are not seeing Jaden Sancho play for Man United. He, of course, scored against Liverpool in that win earlier this season has had good moments, but more generally not great mm. moments and bought to play on the right. Hasn't worked out. Then I want to move to the left. Now, Marcus Rash is really clicking into gear. He's not getting that position back. Is he? If Marcus Rash is playing like he is, mm-hmm. um, but is there another position to come up on the right? Can he play as a 10? I, I don't know, but he needs to, he's not fit. And he's, and that's talking uh, both mentally and physically. I think Eric Ten Hag has spoken about Jaden Sancho uh, in the lead up to the Everton game. And I'll, I'll read him verbatim. I would like him back as soon as possible, but I can't force this process. Uh, I have to show patience, although I don't have patience because we have a lack of options in the front line, players who are capable to contribute in the Premier League. Jaden is one when he is fit who can contribute and then we have an extra option. So we'll have more of a ch- more of a chance of winning a lot of games. We have some hurdles to take still, but I think he's in a good direction. I can't force this process, so I don't. But I'll be really happy the moment he returns to the squad from t- for team training. That's the next step. In this moment, he's not fit enough. The good thing he's back in Carrington and that shows he is making progress. Mm. Uh, It's an article from James Ducker. Ten Hag had noticed a sharp drop in Sancho's form and confidence. And after a series of talks with the player, felt a total reset away from day-to-day training environment was the best course of action. Sancho has also turned off his social media accounts, et cetera, Mm. et cetera, and would not return until he was physically and mentally ready to do so. Sorry, Rob, I've been talking for ages. Uh, do you know what? Like before, before I bring you back in, I'm fine with this. 
absolutely fine with this. Uh, and as much as like you, I, I do a show with uh, fans of other clubs and it's like, well, what's happening with Sancho then? Because that's a lot of money you've spent. And Ten Hag didn't spend this money. However, what I do trust from what I've learned about Eric Ten Hag so far is that he knows what he's doing. And he's proven with Aaron Wan-Bissaka, Marcus Rashford, Diogo Dallo, a number of players that he knows how to get a tune out of players. And he, if if this is the route that he chooses to go down in order to make th- that player better, Sancho in this case, I think you get it right. Absolutely. And I think that with with Jaden Sancho, it is a kind of bit of a Rubik's Cube. You know, like how, you know, what, what were you buying when you bought Jaden Sancho from Dortmund? Where are you going to play him and how are you going to move forward with him? And what, what bits are the player, which bits are the system, which bit is the management? So I think that Eric Ten Hag has taken the same approach of all the players and about giving them opportunity, empowering them, but finding the bespoke key to their door. Yeah, what makes these players tick? And that's where the elite managers excel. That's why Guardiola excels. That's why Klopp excels. They work players out and then they kind of deconstruct them behind the scenes and then put them on a football pitch. And give them power, give them tactics, give them confidence. I think we see about Jaden Sancho. His story is, is long and complicated in a kind of non-complicated way. He comes to Manchester United as the next magnificent seven. You know, Man United spent a year trying to tempt him to come to the club. He wanted to come to Man United for the whole of that period. But of course, there was the Dortmund factor and the way and the, and the fee and all this. You look at it now, you know, imagine United had played 112 million for, for Jadon Sancho. This might be a slightly different conversation, Scott, when we talk about transfer fees and expectation. But he came still for a big fee, and this isn't a, a future England superstar. And we're no longer at that point. So it makes sense to reset. And what do we know about Jadon Sancho? We, we hear this a lot, don't we, about he's not fit. So this is the line coming from the club and actually out of Eric Ten Hag's mouth. But what does that actually mean? Are you telling me that Jadon Sancho can't run around on a football pitch? No, he hasn't got, he's not carrying an injury. We know he had sickness and illness over time, but he's now at a point where he's back at Carrington. He is about to start training with the group again, and he does need to kind of get going. You know, this isn't one of your major players, but how do you get him going if he's a liability? So this is, I think, where Eric Ten Hag stands, because like he said there, he needs Sancho to be fit and ready. But if he's not fit and ready, according to the manager, you literally cannot play him. So people can't sulk about it. Do you know what I mean? You've got to find a way to get this player back. So I think the best example you just used there is Marcus Rashford. Marcus Rashford, at the end of last season, having a really low moment, form out the window, looked a different player, looked like he didn't want to be there. Has Sancho followed the same kind of path? He said about social media. I think all these young lads, you know, this is not to sound like an old man, but all these young lads are massively exposed to a kind of media that most former players in the past haven't. You could live in a bubble. Jadon Sancho, you've only got a member of thing what he went through after the end of the Euros. You know, I think that was crushing for him. It was him, Saka and, and Rashford obviously missed those penalties. Rashford's bounced back, but it's taken him a year and a half. Saka, I think, his mentality, went back to Arsenal, they looked after him, he's brilliant, isn't he? He's amazing, great player. Sancho, I think, is the kind of, you could kind of say like the third wheel there, and that he has struggled, I think, with coming to England as a superstar, but not quite being ready to be that superstar. And then coming and having that number seven taken off him before he'd even put it on the track. <laughs> yeah. So those things... Don't matter to fans because fans look at it as just, you know, how many how many lollipops and you know stepovers did you do this week? How many assists did you get? How many goals did you score? But all that private stuff away from the field really matters. And that's what I think Eric Ten Hag is trying to fix. He's trying to get this player's trust and confidence to a level where he becomes a usable asset again. I only saw the other day, there's a ton of people kind of having a go at Anthony already on the right. He's not worth it. He's not good enough. He needs to deliver more. Well, yeah, everyone has to deliver more. Everyone has to deliver more. But all that matters is that everyone delivers enough to win. That's what it matters. Nothing else matters. Yeah, it's not about individual performances. You want them to be good, but everyone has to deliver together. And I think that's what we've seen with Eric Ten Hag in the last few weeks. Certainly, again, since this, this post-World Cup period, I was worried about this little phase because I was like, players coming back, you know, are they going to perform? And I, I think people seem all right. You know, their fitness levels are good. Attitude is good. So now United have to carry that on. 
I think when you look at Sancho, it's very similar to Rashford. It's going to take time. It took Rashford time to get back to where he is. Now look where he is. The overall feeling from United is that Sancho will be okay. But I think Jadon Sancho needs to do it a little bit differently. Jadon Sancho now needs to look at this, this opportunity at Man United and say, I need to prove a lot of people wrong. Because it will only be three, four, five months down the line, Scott. And this is a different story, yeah? This will be sell Sancho. We're not too far away from those headlines. So he's got to make sure that he comes back. He comes back hard. He shows that he's a great player. And he shows why Man United target him to kind of take the football club forward. I still believe in Jadon Sancho. Whether you play him off the left or the right or wherever, I don't believe in him as number 10. He's never played number 10. He could do it. But I don't see him doing the Bruno role. Just cannot. It's not, you know, he doesn't have that pressing forte in his game or what he does. Um, but he's a creative, and Man United do need creative players on the football pitch. Yeah, you mentioned there, Rob, about Anthony and the criticism he's getting and the price mm. tag. And it did just tweak something in my brain about how Jaden Sancho was that statement signing, right? You know, he was United tried to sign him. They they put these wheels in motion probably even earlier than 2020, but that's the first time I reported on it. Didn't get him for a year. And what comes with that and the promise of a number seven? If if things do turn around, it's like it's it can go one way or the other. Sancho could be, if he doesn't get it right, maybe on the chopping block. He could also be the number seven come next season if okay. things come if things go right and it, it's a refresh. United's problem. As everybody knows, for the for several years has been, we are going to spend a boatload of money on this high-profile player and he's going to be our saviour. And it's that narrative every single year. And can you imagine how much pressure that puts on a lad or on, on any player who plays for Man United in, in any of the teams, you know? They come in with this massive pressure on their back and United look at this and they think, Oh, look at what this can do for us commercially. You look at how United have made a number of... I put Paul Pogba in this, put maybe yeah. maybe, maybe not Angle Di Maria, but I think, you know, there were certain things that made Angle Di Maria unhappy in Manchester, mm-hmm. um, which are out of, out of people's control. But there's uh, Romelu Lukaku was expected to come in and score a boatload of goals. Scored enough, but still obviously was sold and it didn't go well. Uh, there's a ton of them. The problem that United have is, and you compare this to the likes of Manchester City and Liverpool, Man City, can, Jack Grealish is getting a little bit of stick, but Man City can sign Jack Grealish. But their team's working already, so that doesn't mean that Jack Grealish comes in and makes and has to shoulder all of this responsibility of carrying the team. You know, every signing United make, and I include Sancho in this, comes in with this expectation that you will take kick us on to a next level. Every signing that they make, and Liverpool are probably the best team at this, Every signing you make should have whatever fee you pay for them, a minimum of six months to a season to try and get their feet under the table, understand how the team process works and eventually blossom into what you want them to be. Rather than having that criticism straight off the bat, I can imagine that's really difficult to deal with. I, I don't understand like how we kind of... And Anthony as well. But Anthony oh, Anthony's yeah. probably falling into that as well. And, and any young player, like, you know, th- th- this is the thing. I think in real life, you know, away from football, you know, if you're 20, 21, 22, you're not equipped to deal with life's issues, are you? Yet in football, you're expected to play in front of 75 to 80,000 a week, be the hero, be the godhead and be perfect all the time, aren't you? You know, we expect that that normal 21 year old things do not uh, do not affect these young lads because they're athletes. Yet. As athletes, they have to be more disciplined and more in the zone all the time than any of us. Let's be honest. So, you know, you see people in their 30s and 40s don't deal with problems. And yet we're saying to these teenagers and these boys in their early 20s that they had to. So Adnan Yanazai, I think, was a really good example. Yeah. Adnan Yanazai came through. Uh, incredible promise. Looked really, really good. Everything was piled on him. Next, next big thing. And it all just collapses doesn't manage his life off the pitch particularly well, goes to a loan at Dortmund, is absolutely awful. The end. That was the end of Adnan Yanazai. These things affect these young players en masse in terms of mental health and how they look after themselves. They have the responsibility. They have teams that look after them, their own personal teams, but it's how clubs put people forward. Jadon Sancho is never going to be the player on his own that turned it all around, yeah? 
Marcus Rashford's been lucky enough that he grew up at United and that expectation is kind of built into you because you've seen it, you smelled it as a kid, you've seen it from the age of 12 onwards. Jadon Sancho was at City, obviously did really well at Dortmund, but I think it was a bit of a shock factor coming to United because you talk about dysfunction and we talked about, you know, club being in turmoil. Well, this is the club that's in turmoil every few weeks. You know, this is the, the football club and how it's run. You need to get some stability behind the scenes so all these young players can flourish. And I think that's been the, the biggest issue at Man United for so many seasons. And it will continue to be an issue, Scott, unless Ten Hag can get a grip of all of that. The good thing is that seems to be the Ten Hag way. That's his MO. Keeps control of these factors, takes plays individually, but he knows it's about the team winning games. Get the team winning, you can kind of deal with everything else on the fly and as you go along. So I think with Jadon Sancho, that's the thing for him. You know, he had his great period at Dortmund. It was there. It's there. It's gone. Finish. Forget about Dortmund. Dortmund is finished. He's been England international. He's out of the squad now. Forget about England. He now needs to think about what he does at Manchester United and how he's going to do it. Because I do think that whether people want to question his commitment or not, or how he, how he plays the game, he needs to show the manager that he's viable. Just like Garnacho is. Garnacho is an 18-year-old boy. But he's showing everyone, isn't he, that he's viable even at this age. But we've even got Garnacho, though, well. has been through that this season and on the preseason tour. Uh, I, 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 yeah, look, look, even look, even on the preseason tour, I heard like the other day was it in in the um, in the what was the first matches back and stuff like that. And I heard people say, "Oh yeah, Garnacho wasn't very good today." Well, yeah, he's a kid. Of course, he's not going to be good every game. And yet there are fans really, really on that going, oh, yeah, he's rubbish. He shouldn't play today. Let like, get him off the pitch. So you're seeing it with Anthony now. Yeah, Anthony needs to justify his fee. No, he does not. Anthony needs to turn up for work, train hard, and try and just be the best that he can be. And that sometimes takes time. If you're not patient, then you're in the wrong sport. Because it takes time with football. And, and you know, Aaron Wamasaka, really good turnaround, isn't it? He had tons of stuff happening off the pitch last year became invalid as a Man United footballer and is now valid again. So he either stays or you can get a good fee for him now because he's shown he's a footballer again. So all of these things count. And I think with Jadon Sancho, it's a wait and see, but I'm still gambling on the fact that his talent will come through because if you can get the work rate out of him and get the attitude right and get him forward facing in terms of like his career, then I think you're okay. I mentioned Ravel Morrison to you off camera I don't think Ravel is anything like Jaden at all. Different stories, different people, different humans. But talent isn't always enough. So you've got to make sure that the talent translates with application. And I think Sancho will be fine because he's got Ten Hag holding his hand. Just in terms of, you mentioned Aaron Wan-Bissaka there, and I thought of the likes of Wan-Bissaka and Harry Maguire who, mm. who arrived for a combined 130 million. This is Man United's problem. Like, this, this has been... This wouldn't happen under Alex Ferguson. This wouldn't spending, have happened under yeah, Alex Ferguson. Is, yeah, spending is not the problem. Like, this is the whole thing. Like, when we talk about the Glazers and money, like, <laughs> money has been spent. Where it's been spent from, that's a bigger question. You know, we know that, as you said, borrowing it on the company credit card per se. You know, so money has been spent. Spending money is not always the answer. Yeah? Operation is the answer. Structure is the answer. Philosophy is the answer. And then you drill that into players and you get the right players to do that and get wins. So this is that's as simple as football gets, Scott. Football is about winning and winning cures everything. So go and find a way to win and then build all these things as you go along. That's what Man City did for over a long period of time. They've had plenty of managers. They've landed at Guardiola. They spent loads of money. They still will continue to spend money. Man United will still continue to spend money. But the answer isn't always in the checkbook. Yeah, the answer is about the structure of the club. So that's where the next step for United is, isn't it? New ownership, hopefully, and hopefully an ownership that can back the manager, both financially, but also holistically, because I think holistics in any business is probably the most important part of it. Of course, it is not all about spending money, but also when you do overpay to a degree that the United have paid, I'm going to take Harry Maguire as an example here. He was worth half of what United paid for him. And the pressure of him being thrust into that situation by a club who then saw him as the defensive savior has really just not made Harry Maguire's life easy at Old Trafford at all. Aaron Wan-Bissaka, half the value probably should have got him, but because it's United and because they have a reputation for doing it this way, 
it just adds an extra layer of pressure on top of the layer of the expectation that comes with playing for Man United as well. Let's hope absolutely. they move away from this, Rob. Yeah, look, I think all the players in the last 10 years, not not absolutely everyone, but a lot of them, every player that Man United have had to compete for to go and get have been a kind of a failure. Yeah, because they've overpaid. You could probably say only Bruno is the one. Like I was about to say, the only player that in that period, they weren't really competing with Bruno for anyone. Like that Spurs were in the mix. And Bruno talked recently about how Spurs gave him a contract. He was, he was willing to go to Tottenham. You know, he liked the idea of it. But Man United didn't overpay for Bruno Fernandes, did they? Not really. You know, they put the deal together. It was a good wage. It was a pretty good transfer fee in the end. Certainly from the immediate return he's giving you and what he's doing now, he's in the team. But almost absolutely everyone going way back to David Moyes and the Fellaini mess, yeah? You paid more for Fellaini than you could have done before his release clause. And that went wrong. One matter you overpaid for in January because you were desperate and he's a popular guy at Man United, obviously, for over many years, but didn't really return you success, did you? And you can track every single transfer since there where United are competing for a player and it's failed. On the flip, when Liverpool compete for a player, you know, years gone by, they've got the player, the player comes in and they're a success. And it's as easy as that. So you've got to find your right targets. And I think the Man United recruitment has been the story of the failures over the years. Not really the managers or the tactics, but it's been more about the recruitment. They've, they've bought players, oh, well over a billion pounds worth of players, yeah? They've spent more money than pretty much every club on planet Earth on players. And it hasn't worked because they haven't had a strategy. Sums it up. There we go. I think that's our show done. Man United play Everton on Friday night. You're probably listening to this after that game. I'm not going to guess the result, but I, I think I'm optimistic and I'm hopeful. And I think United will win because Everton aren't very good. Touchwood. Everton have uh, got punches chance because this is Lampard's last hurrah. Yeah. You know, I think Lampard might well be sat in the presser, lost his job already at the end of tonight. Uh, or if they get a win, they get something to keep their, keep the season alive with a little bit of a cup run, he survives. So I think that there's an opportunity there for Everton tonight. Uh, I don't think we'll see much rotation at all from Ten Hag. I think he'll put the strongest team out. He wants to win the FA Cup and he's taking it seriously. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. United then play Charlton and then Manchester City and then uh, Arsenal are on the horizon as well at the Emirates. Newcastle showing this possible to take points there this week. Uh, you can subscribe to our show wherever you get your pods on Apple, Google, Spotify, and the likes, and watch us twice a week as well. Head over to the YouTube channel, The Promise and the Manchester United Podcast, is where you can find us. Hit like, subscribe, leave a comment, join the community with us, and uh, follow us on Twitter at underscore Scott Saunders, at underscore Rob, underscore B, and at Promise and MU. Get in touch with us about anything that we've talked about today, anything around Man United. Please, I, I really enjoy when. Uh, People say that they like this show because it just makes me want to make more. Um, so really appreciate that. Um, always need a bit of a shot in the arm as well. So th thanks for those uh, those of you who have been giving us or showing us some love on the socials as well. Uh, Rob, any final thoughts? No, I'd like to reiterate that as well. Thanks for all the shares and everything going into a brand new year. Here we go. It's not a new season, but it feels like it a little bit, doesn't it? So hopefully United meet our expectations and we'll carry on making the promised land for you. Yes, indeed. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. We'll be back next week to talk more things Manchester United. Have a fantastic weekend. Hope United beat Everton and we'll see you soon. <laughs>